Cool. Um, yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, I can see quite a few people joining now, which, yeah, that means the world to me. Thank you very much for joining. Um, this is my first ever Instagram Live. Um, so you, all you guys are now part of this momentous journey. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I was a bit nervous. Um, I am a bit nervous doing this. Um, I mainly just use Instagram to talk, to post about, uh, to, you know, re-story, whatever it's called. I don't even know the lingo, um, all 392 matters. But so yeah, um, this is um, and quite a new thing for me, but hopefully um, people will find this entertaining, insaning, insightful, uh, useful in um, loads of different ways. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about my journey to publication uh, and the 392, uh, being a PhD student um, here in Norwich, here at University of East Anglia, um, talking about um, my ways into academia, if that's what you are interested in, um, finding an agent perhaps, getting your work out there, um, being published, um, and sort of all the things that I've gone through uh, in the last basically a year and a half since I stopped teaching in secondary schools. Um, so yeah, I thought, um, as people are joining, as I thought I'll start off by obviously acknowledging what's been going on in the world um, especially in the last two weeks. Um, it's been a really tough time for so many people, um, what with the coronavirus pandemic and then going into lockdown and whatnot. And um, on a personal level, obviously everybody's experience is going to be so different on a personal level. I think I was coping quite well, to be honest, with um, being on lockdown, being a writer, I was able to just keep my head down and, and try and stay productive. I know that's very different for very different people, but um, I think the footage of George Floyd um, being murdered was, was really sort of quite harrowing and it's, it's really sort of taken me aback a bit um, and sort of made me think about my role um, and the role of literature, as I'll talk about in a bit more detail in just a minute. Um, so, yeah, I'm just, you know, it's been, it's been really tough to be a black man, a black man who, in most of the avenues that he's found himself in, so whether it be academia, whether it be as a writer, whether it be as a football referee, um, has found it quite tough um, being um, of the mine, you know, in the minority. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a really really quite harrowing last two weeks. Um, but I think the point I want to make here is that literature is so important. Um, literature is part of the journey, part of the shift that is happening right now. And I'm I've been really like uh, pleased to see so many really cool reading lists out there um, on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and I think education is, is the key and reading is the key and literature is the key to, to just opening people's eyes about the inequality that exists. There's no doubt about it, as if anybody on my Instagram needs to know, but there's no doubt about it that Britain is institutionally racist and it's up to us, up to everybody to, to try and, and strive for equality um, to, for everybody. And just a few of my recommendations. I mean, first one is David Olasoga. Um, I mean, he is such a fantastic, brilliant historian and he's sort of like, you know, he, he's very palatable. Uh, in the way he presents the facts and um, yeah just a huge fan of uh, black and British um, so I really recommend that I know a lot of these books actually because of what's been going on in the last two weeks are actually quite hard to get to come by um, I know a lot of them have been sold out and this next one is um, now number one in the non-fiction list um, but um, Rennie Edo Lodge's Why I'm No Longer Talking About Race is such a banging read um, so yeah um, yeah, please, if you manage to get your hands on, 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 on these two. And my last one, um, Akala, who's an absolute boss, uh, and his book, Natives. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Akala uh, last year at an event. I was completely sort of in awe. I uh, couldn't even get my words out. Um, he's just an absolute... He, the guy can play football, he can rap, and he can uh, tell you about uh, the struggles of wh what it means to be a black person in, in UK society in a very eloquent and very academic, but also very palatable way. So, um, yeah, absolutely banging. Um, so, yeah, literature is important. Um, just before uh, Clean Prose, uh, a very cool organisation in, Sh in Shoreditch in East London closed down, I was going to do a talk about writing black lives, about writing black men in particular in fiction. Unfortunately, um, it couldn't happen because of coronavirus, but essentially, I was going to talk about lots of things. I was going to talk about craft. I was going to talk about the importance of reading um, good models. Um, but essentially, my main thing that I was going to talk about is we need more black voices out there. We need more black characters. We need more black protagonists. Um, and, you know, black stories have always been important, but now they are essential. Um, and 
for anybody who is a black writer or for a writer who is thinking about including black characters in their work, now is the time to do it um, because, you know, we need our voices heard. Um, so, yeah, that, that's my sort of main recommendation. Um, I know there's been a big hashtag on Twitter at the moment, uh, the publishing paid me hashtag, um, which has been really sort of uh, shocking, illuminating. Um, it, it's showing, essentially, for those of you who haven't seen it, there's a massive discrepancy between the advances that white authors get to in comparison to what black authors get. And I really don't want that to put people off. Um, I know it, that, I mean, there's no doubt about that that exists. Um, but I think now is our time to, to get our st stories out there. And, you know, in my experience, the 392 is, is just a small bit uh, along that journey. I'm going to try and refrain from using the analogy of journey too much because it's so easily done when you've written a book about um, a bus journey. But yeah, I'm going to try and limit to maybe three or four, but there's no promises there. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, the process of getting the 392 published, but the processes of me being a writer um, more more generally. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my second book, although as you, as I'll say a bit later, I can't say too much about it just yet. Um, I'm going to talk about my um, experiences being a PhD student. Um, I'm about two years, nearly two years done, um, and it will take about three or four years to finish the PhD and hand it in and whatnot. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, a bit of contextual background, um, you know, I come from a very modest um, working class background. Um, and I, when I go into schools and I do school talks and school visits, the first slide that I put up is the picture of my estate in Hackney. Um, you know, I, I, I lived um, <laughs> in Hackney, top floor, um, two bedroom house with me and my little brother and, and, and my mum. And, you know, despite the sort of very modest, um, low income background, I was very happy, of course, but, it, you know, I've come a quite a long way, I hope. And I'm on that journey still, whoops, journey. I'm on that journey still to, um, you know, achieving uh, bigger and better things, I hope, uh, at the age of 29. Um, so it doesn't matter, as I say to the students that I, I sort of do talk to, it doesn't matter your background. Um, it doesn't matter um, about your sort of family status and your wealth, you know, just keep striving, keep believing. You need a bit of good luck and you need to network. Um, but there are opportunities out there, of course. Um, my mum was just 18 um, when she had me. She actually got pregnant with me at just 17. Um, and she herself was born in St. Lucia. Um, and for the most part, it was just her and I until my little brother, uh, Tyler, was born when uh, when I was 11. Um, and I was lucky enough to talk about my experiences growing up in Hackney and growing up in a single parent home um, on, uh, sorry, for BBC Radio 4, with, um, their forefort talk, um, which I gave, uh, so it was aired in, on New Year's Day. So if you have time and, and, and want to listen to that, please, please do. Um, it was it was a really proud moment for me. Um, and I think I think they said about a million viewers or a million listeners, sorry, um, which was tuned in uh, to my story about me growing up in Hackney and stuff. Um, yeah, growing up, I wanted to be a million things. Um, I was a huge Man United. I am a huge Man United fan. I'm also a huge Dagenham fan. Um, but I wanted to be a footballer. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a businessman. And all of those different elements, all of those different vocations, uh, manifest themselves in the three nine two. Um, you've got the character of Ray, who is this sort of racist Millwall football fan thug um, in many ways. Even though I think actually there's there's aspects of his life that you can be quite sort of feel sorry for him a little bit. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I was a huge football fan, so I tried to have a few elements of football in there. Um, and I know my agent um, had to tell me to tone it down a little bit um, because you said it might sort of alienate a few readers, um, and it's probably for the best actually. Um, but yeah, I wanted to, I was a huge football fan. Um, I wanted to be a teacher, which obviously is, is is a profession that I later went into. I wanted to be a businessman, and there's a character in the three nine two called Levi. Um, and he mentions about how he used to watch The Apprentice, and that's exactly what I did. Um, I used to watch The Apprentice every week um, because I was I really wanted to um, work in the city and wear, have a nice suit and nice shoes with you know the loafers and whatnot. Um, so what essentially what I'm trying to say here is there's a little bit of me in all of those characters, and I will admittedly say that some of the characters in the 392 are quite problematic. Um, you know, Ray, for instance, as I said, he's a racist football fan. You have the character of Stu, who has these weird fant um, fantasies about the bus driver. Um, so yeah, there are good and bad elements to these two uh, to all of the characters. Um, but in a more sort of general note, they're all a little bit of me. Um, so yeah, 
I wanted to be a teacher, and that's exactly what I did. I um, finished my undergraduate degree, and uh, after a few years, I uh, started my PGC, and I became a secondary school teacher. And th the experience of being um, a secondary school teacher really opened my eyes to what young people um, are thinking and how they interpret the world, uh, their thoughts on politics, their thoughts on um, society more generally, um, the thoughts on religion, um, and it was such a sort of great experience for me to be in front of the classroom and listening to all of those conversations uh, during their formative years. And I'm not going to lie that uh, many of the characters in the 392 are um, sort of fabrications um, that stemmed from uh, students that I taught. Um, the character of Diamond um, is, is based on a student called Diamond, which is very risky, uh, that I taught in my first school I worked at in uh, South London. Um, uh, in in Tulse Hill, um, and um, yeah, it was, she was just so 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 buzzy and vibrant, uh, and I loved the way she um, sort of saw the world. That I started started to write down things she said uh, on my phone and in my notebook, um, and a lot of what she said made it into the free line too. Um, it made writing it a lot easier, I have to say. Um, and she's probably, I think, I'm going to read um, her chapter later on. Um, so yeah, being a teacher um, was a hugely useful experience in, in, in writing um, The 392, definitely. Um, I used to be a referee, I was a semi-pro um, referee for about four or five years. Um, I, used to, I had high blood pressure and a sort of a bad knee so I had to stop. Um, but that um, experience um, also tied in nicely with uh, writing The 392 as well. And I also was, was a poet. Um, I used to write what I called sonnets, bus sonnets. Um, I used to love the sonnet form. The sonnet form is so terse, it's so succinct. 14 lines of poetry um, and you've done it. You've either written it or you've either read it really quickly and it felt so um, accessible, so it felt so attainable. So I used my experience of writing poetry often about London buses um, to, to, for that transition to then uh, write the 392. Um, and I think with the 392 and this new book that I'm writing, poetry has played a very important part. Um, I'm obsessed by um, pace. I'm obsessed by um, the writing being flowing, that your eyes zip along the page. Um, like I'll talk about later, one of the aims that I had for writing the 392 is that there are no boring bits. Um, and I think there's something so beautiful about poetry that it just happens so quickly, so succinctly, so tersely. And I was really inspired by that. Um, my secondary school English teacher was also a huge inspiration to me. Um, I went to school in uh, Archway, North London, um, and a school called St Aloysius, an all-boys Catholic school. And my English teacher was Mr Fowler, Mr Bo Fowler, and I found out um, that he was an author. Um, he wrote a book called um, Skepticism Incorporated, which is um, about a talking shopping trolley, no less. Um, and do you know what? The book was, was, was pretty good. Um, it was inventive and, and whatnot, but just the dynamic of him being a teacher and him also publishing a book which was uh, released with relative success, um, I found so inspirational. Um, and I always um, wanted to emulate uh, Bo Fowler, um, Mr. Fowler to be respectful, but Mr. Fowler's um, sort of dual uh, vocation of being a teacher and a writer. So he was hugely inspirational to me. So I knew at this point, obviously, I was writing poetry, um, but I wanted to write something bigger. I wanted to, to finish a full novel. Um, I wanted to go into Waterstones um, and see uh, my name on the bookshelf. Um, I wanted to see um, my book um, available to buy, and that was a really important uh, and really formative goal of mine. Um, so I set myself the task of trying to write a novel, uh, and this is where sort of the 392 comes in. Um, the first um, idea for the 392 came in about 2014, maybe 2015. I was in North London, uh, I was in Angel, and um, I was just about to get on the 43 bus and I saw a bus driver who didn't look like any other bus driver that I'd seen before. Um, usually bus drivers are older, um, usually white men, um, 
quite boring looking no offense to any bus drivers my dad's a bus driver um but i saw this one bus driver in angel and she looked very different she had um like a headscarf on and jangly gold earrings um she was quite smiley and i was like this is this is bizarre like am i am i still in london um so i wrote down a few lines about her um because i was like this could be a story here perhaps one day. I wrote down a few lines about her on my phone, like, as I often did. Um, and when I got home, I started to play around with this idea of this bus driver. I extended the story a little bit. I said that this story was going from, this route, sorry, was going from uh, Hoxton to Clapton. Uh, and I wrote a whole page or two um, about this very unique looking um, bus driver. And I thought I would print this off, print out 30 copies uh, and give it to my year nine class um, as a sort of starter activity. So I said, guys, I've got this little story here. Um, I didn't tell them I wrote it. Got this little story here. It's by an anonymous person. Um, and it's about um, this bus driver in Hackney. Um, how, I want you to read it and then answer a few questions, a few sort of comprehension questions about it. And let me know what you think more generally. So I, I gave them this task to do. And at the end, they were like, sir, this story is so dry. This story is so boring. Who wrote this? Um, and not knowing, obviously, it was me. And I obviously kept it quiet. Um, but I knew I had some work to do from then because if, you know, they weren't enjoying it, I knew the wider readership um, definitely wouldn't enjoy it. Um, but I knew I had an idea. I had this idea of this bus driver, this unusual looking bus driver. And I had this idea of... Um, it being set in Hackney and that was important because Hackney is, an, is the borough that had gone through so much change um, you know it's gone from an area which of, of, of sort of um, low level deprivation of minor crime um, to then having fancy coffee shops and Jamie Oliver's restaurant at the end of the road um, so I knew I wanted to talk about gentrification and I knew I wanted it to feature, feature this bus driver um, but I knew I had work to do because it was boring apparently and that's something that I didn't want my work to be so I decided um, one year into um, being a newly qualified teacher that I wanted to do a master's uh, in creative writing part time. Um, I was just about enjoying teaching enough uh, to want to stay in it. Um, but I also wanted to write. Um, so I decided to do the creative writing master's part time at City University of London, sort of based just by Barbican. And this was the second time that I applied for the same course at the same place to do a master's in creative writing. Um, back in 2012, um, when I just finished my uh, undergraduate degree in English at University of Sussex, um, I applied to do a creative writing master's at City University of London, um, mainly because I was a typical lazy student and I didn't know what I wanted to do afterwards. Um, and I thought, you know what, I want to continue being a typical lazy student uh, and applied for the master's. Um, and probably for the best, um, having seen my work, which had been very rusty, age 21, um, they rejected me. Um, so I, I didn't actually get into the master's first time that I applied uh, back in 2012. However, back in, in 2015, uh, now a qualified teacher, I applied to, the, to do the same course uh, at the same institute uh, in central London um, and they accepted me. Um, so I started doing um, the master's in creative writing part time at City University of London. And this is a question that I get asked quite a lot. Um, do you recommend doing um, the Masters in Creative Writing if um, you want to get published? Um, and like anything in life, do you know what I mean? It's hugely subjective um, and there's lots of pros and cons, but I'm going to talk you through some of those pros and cons and, and, and talk about my, my experience um, in doing the Masters. It's very expensive, and obviously that's one of the one of the massive um, pitfalls of doing a master's. It cost me ten thousand um, pounds to do the master's part time over two years. Um, I obviously didn't have ten thousand pounds straight away. Um, I uh, paid two thousand five hundred pounds for my own money. Um, my grandmother passed away uh, five years ago, and she left me some money, so I used some of that to um, pay off another two thousand five hundred pounds. Um, and then I had another £5,000 to pay, uh, which I couldn't afford. So I got a loan out, um, which I very nearly paid off um, five years down the line. So it was quite a commitment financially. Um, and I think that's one of the sort of massive drawbacks of doing um, a master's. It does cost a lot of money. 
Um, but for me, it was hugely worth it. I have no regrets. Um, because I have the masters, I managed to get the book published and now I'm doing a PhD. Um, but everybody's experience is very different. Um, doing a master's won't give you all the answers. Uh, your tutors, who in my, in my case were absolutely brilliant, but you know, they won't tell you how to be a brilliant writer. They won't tell you how to be a brilliant author. Um, it's a very incremental process. It's a joint, it's a joint process in many ways. Um, but what I loved about my personal experience at City University of London is um, one of my tutors, Claire Allen, uh, she had just written a book called Poppy Shakespeare, um, which is about a, um, a teenage girl um, who um, is going through some mental health problems and has to sort of stay in this institute. Um, and it's very voice driven, it's very pacey. And she, she, she recognised that my work was a bit like that. Um, and her expertise was just so useful. I remember one time I said to her, I'm writing this book, it's set on a bus, um, but I've done, the, I've done the calculations and I don't think the 392 is going to be anywhere near 80,000 words or anywhere near 60,000 words. It's going to be about 45,000 words. And I, I looked up that a novel should be at least 60,000 words or a novel should be at least 80,000 words. And she said, don't worry about that. Just write the novel that you need to write. If it's short, it's short. If it's long, it's long. Um, if an agent really likes it, if, if, the, if a publisher really likes it, they'll take it on regardless. And it was little expertise like that that proved so useful um, and that reassured me that it doesn't matter um, what I'm writing or how I write it, um, I can get it published. So that was one, definitely one of the benefits of doing the Masters. Um, and also the deadlines. Um, you know, if you're a type of person who um, works the deadlines really effectively, um, then doing the Masters is obviously really conducive to that process. Um, it worked well for me because I knew I had to get a certain amount of words on the page so I could submit it to my tutor for feedback or submit it to my other course mates for feedback. Um, so that's the benefit of doing the Masters in many ways, the fact that it gives you firm deadlines. Um, but if you have, um, if you have, um, what's, that, what's that word I'm looking for? You know, self, self something. Um, yeah, anyway. If if you're good at if you're good at making deadlines for yourself and like sticking to them, then maybe you don't need you don't need it. But um, for me, the deadlines really helped. I remember like staying up late at night because it needed to be in by next week uh, for feedback, and that really helped. Um, the camaraderie with, with course mates is definitely a benefit um, from two from two experiences from doing my masters and from doing the PhD at the moment. Um, so um, I was quite lucky in many ways because I did my masters part time. I had two cohorts of friends uh, because the masters, if you're doing it full time, is only one year. But I was one of only a handful of people doing it part time. So I had two lots of friends, um, usually. Well, there a, lot, a lot of them were UK based, but there was a lot of American people on my course as well. And they were brilliant. I made lots of uh, lifelong friends. And um, whenever I go to America, if I get a chance to post coronavirus, um, I have lots of friends that I can uh, link up with and stay with. Um, so that was really good because the course mates, you know, you go to the pub and you talk about writing, um, you get feedback on your work. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I made a lot of good, really good friends, uh, both UK based and in America and across the world, obviously, um, because of the course. And I, you know, I put that down to doing the masters. Um, I also um, got my agent um, from doing the MA, which is obviously a huge, huge bonus. Uh, to be honest, I didn't really think academia was for me. Um, I didn't think that um, doing a, I'd be doing a master's or doing a PhD, to be honest. I just really wanted to write. Um, but as soon as the course started, I knew that um, this is what I wanted to do and this is something that I wanted to do for a long while. Um, and getting an agent was, was a bonus in many ways. Um, there was always talk on the course that if the work is good, you pick up an agent. If your work is um, sort of um, accessible and whatnot uh, in, in the um, anthology that is produced, at the end of it, then an agent will like it. Um, but I never really believed it, to be honest. I wasn't really doing it for agents. I was doing it for myself. I thought, I'll write this novel, and then I'll worry about the rest of it later. Um, but actually, the contacts that um, the, the university um, made with agents was, was, really, was really helpful, um, and it helped me massively. Um, so, yeah, so sort of to summarise about doing a master's, um, yeah, you need the time and you need the money. Um, so it's definitely something that needs um, real consideration. Um, but for me, I, per on a personal level, recommend it um, wholesomely. 
Um, there, there are loads of different avenues and loads of different platforms out there um, for you to um, improve your writerly craft for free or for a lot less money than a master's. There's no doubt about that. Um, but for me, everything encompassed. Um, I have to say doing a master's was completely worth it, even though it was a huge financial hit. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about planning. Um, it's kind of weird for me because I don't plan. I don't really plan novels uh, or things that I'm going to write. I just sort of go with it. Um, so with the 392, my main aim for writing the 392 was that it was an authentic portrayal of the life that I, um, of the area that I was living in at the time. Um, Hackney was changing so much, like I said, and I didn't really know um, where I stood in the new Hackney. And writing the 392 was part of that cathartic process of trying to understand my place in the world. Um, so I didn't really have any sort of uh, overarching um, sort of chapter breakdowns, um, whiteboards with scrawlings and post-it notes. I just I wrote with heart um, and, and, and hopefully, um, you know, I got to somewhere which was a little bit um, sort of made sense of, of the whole process at the end. Um, but what I did have, I didn't have massive plans or chapter breakdowns, but what I did have was sort of overarching more holistic general aims uh, when I was writing the 392 and this new book. Um, and some, I thought I'd share with you some of the aims that I had um, when I was writing the 392. Um, and so they were, it needs to be readable and pacey. Um, and that's something that is really important to me. Um, I want your eyes to zip along the page. I want people to uh, potentially read it in one sitting. I know that um, Dean Atto is a, is a poet who I really admire. He said, I should, uh, writers should be careful about saying um, you should be able to read this in one sitting because it's not fair to people who, who can't read that fast. And I completely get that. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, you know, sort of in tune with that point. But, I, you know, for those that could, I wanted it to be a book that you could read in one sitting. I want it to be pacey. And that links to the next sort of aim of mine. It says no boring bits. Um, and obviously that's hugely um, quite, quite vague and quite broad. But I wanted, you know, I really wanted it to be um, really engaging, uh, filled with tension throughout. Um, my next aim was poetry in every line. Again, that's very broad. Um, but it's very important for me that um, coming from, you know, my background was writing poetry, writing those sonnets, like I talked about. It was very important for me that that, that transition was clear um, from the poetry stage into the novel stage. Um, and my work, a little bit in the 392, but definitely in the new book that I'm writing, I've just finished writing, um, it needed to include rhymes and half rhymes and alliteration and repetition uh, and compound adjectives and dynamic verbs. There needed to be this incessant pace throughout because I don't want a reader to get bored. I want a reader to carry on reading. I want, I want it to be a page turner, but not in the sort of cliched hackneyed sense. I want it to be a page turner in a, a sort of a wholly accessible way um, for very wide readership. Another strange one is that I want it to be grime infused. That is literally one of the bullet points that I put here um, on my making um, on my aims. Um, now, what that means is I don't really know, but I'm I love listening to sort of grime and drill music because I think it's just so clever. I think it's I love the way they play, you know play with words, the puns they use, um, how topical topical references to football, topical references to society, and I wanted to emulate a small aspect of that in the three nine two. Um, I wanted it to be melodic and musical and have that sort of lilting pace to it throughout. So I listened to a lot of grime. I listened to a lot of Kano uh, in particular, whose album, um, not Hoodies or something, that's a new one, one before that. Andy's going to kill me for that. But I listened to a lot um, during writing the 392. I wanted it to have um, a sort of musicality because being a Londoner, there is that musicality in, in the atmosphere. Um, the way you speak to people, uh, the way you have to be streetwise, um, the way you ride your bike, the way you get on the bus, there is this sort of, um, yeah, there is this sort of dy dynamism, this movement, this incessant movement. And I wanted that to be a sort of important thread in the 392. Um, yeah, so like I said, I didn't write, I didn't plan the 392. And I didn't plan the second book either. I just had aims that I kept coming back to. Made in the manner, thank you, Andy. Um, I just had aims that I keep coming back to. So whenever I was writing or whenever I was editing, um, I would come back to these aims to make sure that every sort of element of it uh, tied in nicely to one of those aims. 
So that was the, those aims for the 392. And the book two, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail a little bit later, but book two is so similar to book one in, in these aims. And I had to delete some of them because um, I can't reveal too much about it just yet. But um, something that I can say is that poetry in every line, again, in book two. And I think that's even more the case um, in uh, the second book than it is for the first book. I really want to keep that pace, that movement, that melodic, lilting sense of dynamism. Um, the second bullet point, full of pace, urgency, and tension. Uh, and tension, obviously, is a big theme of the 392, in which there's this, you know, strange man at the front with a bag on his back. Um, and this is a different kind of tension in book two. Um, but um, tension that exists nonetheless, and that's one of the aims. It needs to be heartfelt and emotional. Um, you know... Um, book two is about, as I'm talking about a little bit later, book two is about a real living person. It's a novel about a real living person. Um, and it needs to be a story which people can relate to. It needs to be heartfelt and it needs to be, you know, it needs to make people think. Um, so that's one of the aims. And lastly, it needs to be illuminating. I'm writing about someone who um, had a career in the spotlight. Um, so people will know about him already. Some people will not know about him already, but it needs to make sure that it reveals um, in a very sort of sincere way a lot about his story. Um, so yeah, I don't make big plans. I just have these aims that I keep going back to. Um, yeah, so writing 392, I took everything so seriously. It needed to be as authentic as, as possible. Um, so the 392 is a route that does not exist. It is a completely made up route. Um, it goes from Hoxton to Highbury Corner, essentially. Um, and here's a little... Um, sort of secret, I suppose, in many ways. Um, the 392 as a route in my head existed long before I even started writing the 392 as a book. Um, the Poking Books, guys, who has, is, the Poking Books is a podcast that I um, did an did a episode for a, a few months back and they would know what I'm talking about. I, um, I've always been obsessed by London buses and transport and maps and routes. Um, so I used to, as a kid, when I, I used to design a route which go from um, my house to my friend's house, a bus route that'll go from my house to my friend's house, or uh, a bus route that'll go from my nan's house to my dad's house. I was always obsessed by making these fake bus routes. And I would even um, write to the bus companies, age 10, 11, 12, and say, look, guys, I've got this idea for a brand new route. And it goes from, um, it goes from Greenford in West London to Crystal Palace in South London. And, and obviously they would write back and say, this is a terrible idea and it costs a lot of money. But anyway, I used to write, uh, you know, I used to make these bus routes. Um, and the 392 as an idea as a bus route existed long before the 392 as a book. I wanted a route that would go along uh, um, my road where I lived because there was no buses down it. Um, but I'd, so I decided to sort of um, amalgamate both these aims of creating this bus route and my writing passions um, to write the 392. Um, so I, I went to Hoxton and I, I walked the whole route and I took pictures along the way um, of everything I saw. Um, bus stops, post offices, leisure centres, uh, roundabouts, local college, um, Boris bikes, all of them. Um, and I took pictures uh, and I included it uh, in some way in the 392. So if anybody from London or Hackney says, hang on, um, you know, Britannia Leisure Centre, um, actually doesn't have that car parking, whatever, um, you know, it, it actually is, hang on, I, I know because I did it. I walked the route, um, you know, hang on, why is that bus stop there? Um, you know, actually, it's really authentic, essentially, is what I'm, I'm saying. Um, I, I made sure that it was as authentic as possible. Um, anyway, so I, yeah, wrote the 392 um, as part of my, well, my master's, but for the course, I only had to submit 15,000 words um of my story um so it wasn't it was nowhere near novel length fifteen thousand words is any it's, it's quite small um but i did submit it uh, after the two years of doing the masters um at the time the 392 was called journey um which is you know it's an okay name but um i think it wasn't sort of um you know, i didn't have the identity that was needed when it's going to be um sold hopefully to publishers and that my agent said um, eventually. Um, so yeah, but it was called Journey at the time. Um, and I managed to um, get a good mark for it. I managed to get a distinction um, for Journey, um, which I was really chuffed about. Um, I knew in the back of my mind that I could get one. It was always in the back of my mind that I could get one. 
Um, but the fact that I, I managed to get a distinction for it was I was really chuffed with. Um, and that really opened my eyes to academia. Like I said before, I didn't really see myself as going into doing a master's and then becoming and then doing a PhD. But I think um, my experiences doing the master's at City University of London really helped. Um, and then obviously getting the distinction really opened my eyes to what is out there. Um, and yeah, so I think the next the next thing was now that I had this distinction, like what, what am I going to do with this story that I had? Um, I didn't have a publisher. I just had a good mark in the master's. So I um, just carried on, carried on teaching. Um, and uh, I remember I was teaching year 11. Um, well, they would have been year 10, actually, year 10. And I was teaching and I did something naughty. I checked my phone as they were probably doing a, a mock essay or something. Uh, and as I checked my phone, I saw that I had like three or four emails from different agents uh, saying that they read my um, my first few chapters of Journey, which was in a anthology, um, and they liked it and they would like to um, meet me. Meet me, and I was so like over the moon. I was completely gassed. Like I can't believe um, that this this the story that I'd written for my masters had actually garnered attention from actual literary agents. Um, and I remember I was just so excited. My year 10s, I was like, sir, why are you so hyper? And um, yeah, it was just a really great experience to have interest from literary agents um, about my about my book, which was called Journey at the time. Um, so yeah, I um, had various meetings with various different agents who uh, wanted to um, possibly represent me. Um, but a lot of them said, when I said to them, look, I've got this idea for a book, but I haven't actually finished it yet. A lot of them said, oh, fair enough. I thought you'd finished it. Um, like, get back to me in six months, one year, one year and a half when you've actually finished a novel. Um, but then there was one agent, uh, who's my current agent, Philippa Sitters, who said, OK, look, you've only got 15, 20,000 words, but I like what you've written so much. Um, I want to take you on now. Um, and that's being very impatient um, and also really you know, really getting on with Philippa and liking the vision she had for, for, for Journey, as it was called then, um, I decided to sign in October 2017 with Philippa Sitters. I had a literary agent within months of finishing the Masters and I was, you know, I was really, I was really, really um, infused by that. Um, and it just showed, you know, the contacts that I, um, or that were provided by the university really came to fruition um, and it was actually really conducive. Um, so I had an agent um, and she said to me, look, um, obviously I can't send this out for submission, you've only written 20,000 words. Um, so what you need to do is um, get it written, get the rest of it written. Um, you know, when can you get it done by? And she's, you know, she said, uh, can you get it done by the end of the year? And it was October then. Um, and I said, yeah, I can. So I would go to work, I would mark books, plan lessons, teach lessons, uh, come home and then I would work uh, until quite late on at night to try and get this book done. I needed to go from about 20,000 words to about, to about 50,000 words, 60,000 words. Um, and over the course of three months, um, I managed to do it. I remember that it was the last day of term uh, at the school I worked in um, at the time called Hampstead School in North London. And I managed to, um, I managed to get the first draft of the 392. Um, which was still called Journey then. Uh, I managed to get the, the first draft of, of Journey uh, printed off using the school computers, naughty, um, by the last day of term. Um, so in three months, I'd gone from about 15, 20,000 words to about 60,000 words. Um, so yeah, I did a lot of, it was, it was, it was a big task. Uh, so I sent it to uh, my agent around Christmas time. Um, and... Um, yeah obviously it was rough it was rubbish to be honest it was really really rough um but philippa was just so supportive and you know she and i managed to um make the manuscript good in about three or four months after that i sent her the first draft um i was quite lucky because philippa was um quite hands-on um she obviously spent a lot of time on working on the 392 manuscript um making it as good as it can be um so yeah i owe a lot to to philippa for that time she put in at the very beginning um, yeah, so had an agent, managed to get it done. Um, and about sort of April, May 2018, um, Philippa said, it's time that it's time to send it out for submission. It's time to get it published. And obviously I was really excited about that. Um, you know, the process of your work being out for submission is, is a hugely exciting 
time. Um, I was checking my emails every single day. Um, no, like several times every single day, um, checking my emails uh, to see if anybody had snapped it up. Um, and to be fair, um, publishers were in touch more or less um, straight away. Um, within days for some of them, within weeks for some of them. Um, yeah, and it was it was a really sort of uh, exciting exciting time for the manuscript. Um, the first people to get back, I believe, uh, was Granta, um, and they they got back um, within like I think it was like a week. I think my agent said it was the quickest the quickest response she's had to a book, um, which either could be good or bad. Um, it turned out to be a bit bad, but also a bit good. But this is what they said. They said, um, so this is Granta. They said it's completely brilliant. Um, there's poetry in every line. I was so happy they said it's, there's poetry in every line because that was one of my aims. Um, but they said it was a little bit too commercial for them, um, which I completely understood. Um, and so, yeah, it, uh, unfortunately, it was a no. And that was the sort of the process um, for about three or four different publishers. There was lots of really good things. They loved the younger characters in the 392, which was called the 392 now. The name had changed. Um, there was lots of... They, they loved the pace. They loved the poetry in every line. Um, they loved the younger characters in particular, um, but they weren't so keen, perhaps, uh, on some of the older characters. They said they needed a bit more work, and I was like, that's fair enough. I, I'm, you know, I knew in my heart of hearts that this wasn't completely ready yet. There still needed to be some formal editing to take place. Um, but yeah, so another company said, um, sorry, another, this is Serpent's Tale. Um, they said the book's strength is in, is in the digressive life stories of its characters, which work against the building of tension about what's going to happen on the bus. Um, I like the younger characters. They're particularly convincing. Um, I think you are a genuine talent. And also, you know, they said some really, really lovely things. And I know that not every publisher, um, not every editor um, attached to a publisher um, writes extensive emails sometimes you might get a blanket email um, but it seems in my case um, which I was really thankful for um, their advice or their comments or their feedback uh, was actually quite um, heartfelt um, and sincere um, so yeah I had a lot of heart so after about three or four um, really really close ones um, close rejections how I say but like really it seemed it seemed genuinely they seemed like they were really interested but just needed a bit of too much work perhaps um, I was a little bit dejected, I'm not going to lie, um, but my agent said, look, don't worry, I only sent it out to a few publishers for that very reason. Um, you know, there's no point sending it out to a million publishers straight away, because if they all say no, then we're, you know, we've got nowhere to go, we've got no, no room to move to. Um, so we only sent it out to a few publishers, and the no's were actually really good no's. Um, I think Philippa actually said they were some of the best rejections that, you know, um, that she's, she's ever heard. Um, so she said, look, we have breathing room to make changes and approach other editors. So that was really good. Uh, and then eventually, um, like, Own It got in contact um, after Philip and I sent the manuscript after a conversation on Twitter. Um, and as soon as they said they wanted to publish it, I knew that was it. I knew I wanted to go with Own It. Um, I knew their work from before. I knew... Um, Robin Travis's Prisoner to the Streets, I'd read because a lot of the kids in my school had read it and loved it. Um, I'd read J.J. Bowler's book. And I knew as soon as, they, as, soon as I got that email, um, I knew that I really wanted, there was no other publisher that I wanted. I wanted to own it. I loved their ethos. Um, I loved what they were about. I loved the authors they had on their books. Um, and, you know, they, Philippa could have stopped the submission to the rest of the publishers straight away because there was no going back. I knew straight away that I wanted to go with own it. Um, and, there's, you know, I've never looked back since. Um, it's been a real pleasure being published by a forward-thinking um, sort of family uh, that own it. Oh, um, it's, been, it's been really brilliant to be involved in a, what's, a very intimate WhatsApp group with everybody who is um, associated with own it. Um, all our fears are alleviated. We talk about triumphs. We talk about successes. About you know, it's brilliant. Um, it really is a family, and I know that analogy is used quite a lot when we talk about own it, but it really, really is. Um, and um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure of, um, being published by a company that I think um, started maybe about five years ago. Um, Crystal, the owner and the founder, wrote a fantastic piece just yesterday uh, for the bookseller about why she started own it. Um, she used to work for Penguin Random House. 
she she was doing the contracts and um was was noticing that there weren't enough black voices or enough sorry underrepresented voices being published and she decided to um start own it and honestly it's been it's been a, it's been a whirlwind it's been an absolute absolute whirlwind um so yeah own it emailed and they said they loved it and i knew straight away that um I knew straight away that i wanted to be published by them um but, it, <laughs> but then there was a little bit of a dilemma i suppose within um a few days of being um uh, of own it showing their interest in the 392 um penguin um i i previously applied for a penguin um sort of uh, mentorship so to speak their right now scheme um and i got shortlisted um so out of 1700 um artists and writers um they shortlisted 44 writers and illustrators um to to go and be mentored for a year by penguin random house um and i had a sort of a real dilemma um about whether to um you know go with own it or think about penguin random house and this scheme called the right now scheme um but then i decided to to publish um the 392 with own it because i knew the process would be a lot quicker and i knew the 392 was a book that needed to be published in 2019 i was talking about brexit i was talking about topical themes i was talking about um you know, prejudice that existed in 2019. I was talking, I was making all these topical references to Stranger Things and Netflix and uh, and, and loads of different uh, musicians and whatnot and all these songs and it needed to be published in 2019. Uh, I didn't want to wait a year um, and then maybe be published by Penguin. So I decided that all things considered, there was no doubt about it, own it were the right company for me. However, saying that, um, right now... Um, which is a scheme, a mentor scheme, which um, Penguin are running, is a fantastic scheme. The applications for that have just closed, unfortunately. But if they go, if they go again next year, I really recommend any sort of aspiring authors to um, apply for it. Um, you send them, uh, I think, 1,000 words, um, and they um, give you some feedback on that. And, um, yeah, you could be mentored by, by Penguin Random House, one of the biggest publishing houses in, in, you know, in the country. So, um, yeah. Um, but yeah, Own It have been fantastic. Um, so the book, The Hardback, came out um, in... Um, when did it come out? In 20... April 2019. Yeah, April 2019. And it's been brilliant ever since. I've um, been to WOMAD Festival, talked about my journey and my experience. I've been on BBC Radio London. Um, one of the most amazing bits, sort of amazing moments, was what I talked about before about going into a bookshop and seeing your book uh, on the bookshelves has been fantastic. And I was able to do that, um, you know, in many times across the year. Waterstones, foils have been super supportive. Um, every time I go into Stratford, um, the 392 is always plastered right at the front, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, so yeah, um, and doing festivals like the Stoke Newington Literary Festival. And it's just really weird because within, it was, I, I stopped working as a secondary school teacher in uh, July, 2018 and by april 2019 the 392 was published um so it was quite a whirlwind year uh, it happened so quickly um so yeah no i you know i owe a lot to own it and um yeah they're doing great things they're doing great things and at the end i'm going to talk about some of the things they are doing this week about for the um festival a bit about my phd um so i'm doing my phd um at uea like i said uh so i here in norwich um and it's yeah it's tricky because doing um a phd in creative writing at probably one of the best institutes that you could possibly do it in as UEA is um it's pretty nuts um there's a lot I feel like there's a bit of pressure on us to make sure that we are writing um decent books um like Kazuo Ishiguru um E McEwen Louise Doughty Diana Evans John Boyne have all gone through um courses creative writing courses at UEA and you know, I'm two years here now and it's been, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been a great experience. Um, but yeah, I do feel a bit of pressure that, you know, what I produce um, while I'm here has to be of a decent quality. But I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm on that journey. Um, so yeah, book two is, like I said before, it's a novel based on a real person. Um, I call it biofiction. Um, I, I didn't call it biofiction. It is biofiction. Um, I don't even have a title for it. I don't have an official title for it. I've changed the title of this book about five or six times. Um, you know, because I'm writing about a real person, that person has to be happy about it as well. Um, so yeah, there is no fixed title at the moment, but and I think that's okay. You know, 
like you know, I'm sure you've heard that you know you often give a title to your work right at the very very end. Um, so yeah, there's still a bit of bit of room there to change if needed. Um, it's very very different to the three nine two in many ways. Um, aesthetically, it will look a bit different. Um, I, I've tried to be quite clever with how the words look on the page. I put this tweet on Twitter maybe about a month or two ago that whoever has to typeset this novel, which means like, you know, the order and the layout of the words is gonna have a massive task on their hands because I'm trying to do all sorts of clever things, but things that for me will make it a more conducive reading experience, uh, make you keep reading. Um, so yeah, it's very different in many ways to the 392. 392 was about 45, no, 48,000 uh, 48, words. This one is at the moment about 65,000 words. Um, so yeah, a little bit longer. But I don't want it to be too long. Uh, like I said, I like my text to be um, <laughs> quick reads and accessible and whatnot. But, um, but we'll see what happens because I still have to edit it. Um, it's written in second person, which is rather controversial. Um, so it's written using the second person you instead of the first person I. Um, and it's, yeah, it, might, it will take a reader a bit of time to get used to. But I think once you're in, you're going to be completely engrossed by it. Um, so, yeah. Um, and, it, you know, I've put here a little bit about my writing routine, very different to book one. Uh, book one was written um, sort, of in, in sort of fleeting moments uh, on my way to work or um, sneakily <laughs> in work, listening, you know, writing down conversations that the kids were having or um, late at night on my phone. This one I had all the time in the world to write mainly. Um, I've got a study here in which I can work, a very conducive space. Um, I spent a year uh, the first year of my PhD, mainly just thinking about what I wanted to write. I only wrote 5,000 words in one year for this book. I was just getting my research done. Um, I was interviewing the person that I'm writing about a few times. Um, and then I spent the second year, uh, which is what I'm in now, writing it. So, um, yeah, so it'll probably take about two and a half years to write the, free, um, to write the, sorry, the book to um, all in all, uh, including editing time. So a year of thinking, really, a year of thinking, research, um, um, watching TV, <laughs> watching YouTube videos, um, and then one year of actually hard writing. Um, I might say hard writing. Um, I don't necessarily mean writing from nine to five necessarily, um, but um, yeah, writing quite a lot of it down. Um, but yeah, the book is only about 70% of my PhD altogether. Uh, the other 30% is um, I'm, I'm looking at the depiction of black sportsmen uh, using their autobiographies as literary reference points. So I've been reading lots of football autobiographies and thinking about how their story, which is often told by a ghost written uh, white journalist, um, often isn't the story um, that deserves to be told. There's a real discrepancy between um, what the, the, the subject of the autobiography, let's take, let's say someone like, I don't have any examples here, but like uh, Jermaine Pennant, for example, um, how his story has been um, sort of how it, how it manifests through this very white gaze um, of a, uh, a white journalist who never played football and how there's a discrepancy between the story that he expects to be told and the story um, that actually um, deserves to be told. And, and my book, which is about a black sportsman, uh, acts as a riposte to that. Yeah, it's convoluted, but, you know, um, it's really enjoyable. I'm really, I'm really enjoying it. So, yeah, um, that's, that's where I'm at now. Um, I thought I'd, I would, before I get, before I read a little bit, um, I would just sort of think about some top tips uh, for people who are wanting to write and, and thinking about being writers. Um, yeah, like, I know this sounds... Um, quite small but make that first paragraph absolutely banging uh, make it vivid make it profound make it memorable i know a lot of people who are looking for for agents um looking to get published um yeah you've got to make that first page um as good and as engaging as possible um so yeah make get that get that done um Writing exercises can help. And I, I mean, this is advice that I don't really take myself. But when I do do it, it really, really works. Some days when, I don't, when I'm feeling lazy and I don't want to write, um, doing a writing exercise can help. So like a free write. So what I do sometimes, and I've taught, done this in my classes in the past, is get a book um, and take the first line from it and then spend 10 minutes doing a free write. Um, your pen can't leave the page. 
um, inspired by that first line. Um, the first line of the 392, for instance, is inspired by Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Um, so the first line of the 392 is... Hackney born and raised, I grew up on the street, the block, the bits, the estate, the hood, the ghetto, the ends, the manor. And I was inspired by, obviously, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Um, so, yeah, on uh, free rights. Um, I also did this activity because... Um, the new book, I wanted it to be poetic. I wanted to include as many compound adjectives as possible. Uh, compound adjectives are like, uh, you know, two adjectives joined together with, with a hyphen. And I was just like being so lazy about um, the manner in which I was trying to write down all these compound adjectives. I just did one exercise um, and um, I had a list of 40 compound adjectives I could have used. So yeah, doing writing exercises can really help, even though I need to do it more often myself. Uh, right from the heart... It's okay if it doesn't sound literary. Um, you know, your voice needs to be heard no matter how it sounds. Like, it might not sound incredibly um, convoluted or literary, but that doesn't matter. Um, you, you know, your voice really matters. So write in the voice that you feel most comfortable with. Um, have belief. Um, I think everybody has the potential to, to write a good book. Um, I really do believe that. It doesn't matter if you have a degree or don't have a degree. Um, it doesn't matter if you've studied creative writing or not studied creative writing. Um, I honestly think everybody has a story in them and I really want to hear more voices from, from people in the margins. Um, editing, editing is your friend, I've put. Like, honestly, once you finish, like, the real beauty is on earth once, once you edit your work. Um, print out your book over and over again and read it over and over again until you get bored of it. Read it. That's what I did. <laughs> That's what I'm doing at the moment. I'm printing off, reading it, reading it, reading it until I get bored of it. I want to make sure every sentence is in place uh, and everything is in order. Um, feedback, uh, yeah, share your work with uh, two or three people whose opinion you can trust. Sometimes workshops are intimidating, like whole, cl whole class workshops when you do a master's or when you go to a session or whatever, because um, you've got like 10, 12 people who, who, who are reading your work. And that's not always um, for the benefit of, your, of the process. I would say, um, yeah, like share, people, share it with really close friends, two or three maximum um, to get your feedback. Um, yeah, and then obviously read lots. Um, read books you enjoy. Read books you inspire. You're you know you're inspired to emulate. Um, okay, I'm going to end by reading um, a chapter from the three nine two. I think I'm running a little bit over. That went really quickly. Um, I'm going to read a, um, from a character called Boxer. Uh, Boxer is a 16 year old um, boy in school uh, who's on this bus in the 392 obviously um, but he's actually a really lovely boy I hope um, he's called Boxer because his initials are KO um, and he's at the front of this bus at the moment he's sitting down uh, well, he's just about to sit down and he's talking to rather controversially he's talking to his older brother's um, older brother's baby mother soon to be soon to be baby mother yeah okay Oh, it says I've only got two minutes remaining. That's a bit peak. Okay, I'll, I'll just read um, and see how we get on. Boxer, she says. It's Natalie. And I swear for a moment as I look into her big brown eyes and see her long eyelashes fluttering up and down like the butterflies in my stomach, the world seems to slow down and this weird feeling comes over me like I'm about to sneeze. Sorry, I just it says that it will cut out at 8pm, leave and come back. Okay. I'll keep reading for now, and then I'll, 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 do a, a, I'll rejoin in a minute. Thought it was you, she says. What's good? Up close, she looks amazing. So buff and kind and sweet. She's been to the flat before, like when she comes round late at night to secretly see my brother, and she always looks decent. But usually it's dark, and she's wearing my brother's extra large Alessi hoodie, so you can't really see how banging her body is. Today, she looks so beautiful. It's strange she's my brother's baby mother. He should feel so lucky to have a good looking girl like her. Obviously I don't know the full story but even if something bad did happen I still wouldn't treat her like he does. That's too deep. Her hair is long and curly. Her skin is soft looking and brown like the inside of a Snickers. Her body looks curvy in the right places even though there's a baby in her belly. You can tell she used to work out, play sports and go to the gym and that. She looks good like a girl you would proudly take to KFC or a house party in the ends or shopping in Stratford. She's wearing a little leather jacket and a Supreme t-shirt. She should probably be wrapped up warmer in her conditions, but I'm sure she knows what she's doing. What's good, she said. 
I wish I could reply with something smart or something cool, but I can't get the nice words out because I'm all shy and nervous. Good? Well, not bad. You? I don't really know what to say. I know people are watching.